it's Alistair McGrath again talking to you about my textbook, Christian Theology and Introduction. So we now come to the second of two chapters dealing with the Christian understanding of the significance of Jesus Christ. Chapter 10, which we considered in the previous presentation, concerns the identity of Christ, Christology. Chapter 11 deals with the work of Christ, focusing on two main questions. First, how is salvation linked to the death and resurrection of Christ? And second, what is salvation anyway? So we begin with a reflection on the relationship between the identity and the function of Jesus Christ. And traditional Christian theology, as we saw in the previous presentation, holds that Christ is both human and divine. In other words, the idea of the two natures of Christ. And there's a very important distinction here between functional and ontological Christology. How is Christ's function linked with his identity? How is identity related to his function? In what way is the ability of Jesus Christ to reveal God and uh, redeem humanity determined by his identity? So that's an important point to think about. Now the phrase theories of the atonement, again theories of the atonement, is often used to refer to ways of understanding how Christ's death changes the human situation. And these often interpret the divinity of Christ as the ground of his ability to bring about salvation and his humanity as the means by which he is able to bring God's saving power into contact with fallen human nature. And we find this approach, for example, in Athanasius' classic treatise of the fourth century entitled On the Incarnation. A major section of this chapter deals with four main types of theories of the atonement. The cross as a sacrifice, the cross as a victory, the cross as forgiveness, and the cross as a demonstration of God's love. And in each case, we look at the foundations of these approaches and we follow this through with a careful examination of how this idea was explored by Christian theologians down the centuries. This is followed by a substantial section which deals with how salvation itself is understood as the transformation of the human situation. And examples of the concept of salvation include being made divine, being made or being pronounced to be righteous in the sight of God, the achievement of authentic human existence, and spiritual liberation. So we look at a range of models of salvation, noting their strengths and weaknesses before we move on to consider how salvation is appropriate by individual believers and by the community of faith. So that's a very short overview of the chapter. Let's go into things in more detail. The chapter looks at two questions. First, how salvation is possible, and second, how it is grounded in the history of Jesus Christ. So to put this another way, what is the basis of salvation according to Christianity, and how is salvation to be understood? One of the first points made in this chapter is that the language of salvation does not necessarily have any specifically Christian reference. The word salvation can be used in a thoroughly secular manner. For example, uh, Soviet writers during the 1920s would often speak of Lenin as the savior of the Russian people. Or again, military coups in African states during the 1980s frequently resulted in the setting up of councils of salvation aimed at restoring political and economic stability. So it's important to understand the quite distinct meaning of salvation in a Christian context. We need to be clear we are talking about Christian understandings of this idea of salvation. So the opening section of this chapter is entitled Christian Approaches to Salvation. And it looks at a range of issues, for example, the way in which salvation is linked with Jesus Christ and the way in which salvation is shaped by Jesus Christ. And it also includes discussion of the eschatological aspects of salvation. So let's look at that in a little more detail. The Christian understanding of salvation has past, present, and future elements. It's not simply a future hope, and it's not simply a past achievement. 
It is a past event which secures the foundation of salvation, but it's also the present day assurance that something transformative has happened. And it's also something that remains to be achieved fully in the future. So the Christian understanding of salvation is about something that has happened, something that is now happening, and something that has yet still to fully happen to believers. We then move on to look at Christian interpretations of the death of Christ on the cross. And as I mentioned, we often use the phrase theories of the atonement to refer to these. And these theories are, descent, are really, if you like, um, centered on four controlling themes or images. And these are not mutually exclusive. And many theologians adopt approaches which weave together elements drawn from more than one of these categories. The first group of approaches build on elements of the Old Testament's cultic worship, above all, sacrifice. Sacrifice is about enabling people to enter into the presence of God. In the same way, the death of Christ is a means by, which enables us to enter God's presence. And we find this approach particularly in the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament. And Christian theologians who draw on this imagery often present Christ as both the sinless high priest and the perfect sacrificial offering, allowing human impurities to be cleansed so that Christians can draw close to God. So the key theme here is that Christ removes a barrier which prevents sinful humanity from approaching to God. A second approach interprets the death and resurrection of Christ as a victory over sin, death, and Satan, liberating believers from their influence and presence. And this theme is very often expressed nowadays using the Latin phrase Christus Victor, Christ the Victor. And the image of victory over the devil has been enormously popular, particularly during the Middle Ages. The um, medieval idea of the harrowing of hell is a very good example of this approach. And this way of thinking holds that after dying on the cross on Good Friday, Christ descended to hell and broke down its gates in order that the imprisoned souls might go free. And you might like to look at this 1509 woodcut by the German artist Albrecht Dürer, um, which depicts Christ as the one who breaks down the gates of hell and allows its prisoners to go free. It had enormous popular appeal and was incorporated into the medieval mystery plays. And interestingly, you also find it in the narrative of C.S. Lewis's famous novel, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. A third group of theories of the atonement, of the atonement depict Christ's death as a satisfaction, something which enabled a penalty or a satisfaction to be paid for sin, and thus, in effect, made the forgiveness of human sin to be morally and legally possible. And these theories began to gain influence during the early Middle Ages. Anselm of Canterbury, for example, gave a very detailed theological basis of the Incarnation, which placed an emphasis on the need for a human being to pay the price of sin, while noting that only God is able to pay that price. So the Incarnation brings God and humanity together. Christ is the one who, as a man, as a human being, has the, the obligation to pay, but as God incarnate, has the ability to pay and thus set humanity free. Now, these approaches were developed further during the 16th century by writers like John Calvin, who felt it was very important to demonstrate that God had acted justly and righteously in forgiving sin. And it's clearly seen in one of the verses in the very well-known Good Friday hymn, there is a green hill far away. So let me read this verse to you. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Then we come to a fourth group of theories of atonement, which foreground the theme of love. The incarnation and atonement are a demonstration of 
of God's love for humanity, God's commitment to humanity. Now, this theme is incorporated into most theories of the atonement, but it was given particular emphasis by a number of writers, including the medieval theologian Peter Abelard. And during the 18th century age of reason, many rationalist writers actually, in effect, reduced Christ's um, uh, saving work to the demonstration of God's love. Christ's death on the cross was seen simply as a human act of self-giving, having no transcendent reference. Now, these four different approaches, I think, are probably best seen as partial and potentially complementary accounts of the significance of the death of Christ. But this chapter also looks at other questions about the meaning of the cross of Christ. What about the theme of violence? Does that have theological significance? And we look at the views of René Girard, which are very illuminating at this point. And also a very important question. How can the death of a single person achieve universal significance? And we look at this point with particular reference to the question of how a male saviour can redeem women. Thus far, the chapter's focused on the grounds of salvation, but what about the nature of salvation? So a long section in this chapter looks at Christian understandings of what salvation is all about. And it opens by looking at some images of salvation that we find in Paul's letters in New Testament. And throughout those letters, Paul uses a rich range of images to illuminate and clarify what benefits the death and resurrection of Christ secure for believers. And Paul clearly assumes that his readers are familiar with both the cultic rites of Judaism and also some contemporary cultural practices within the Roman Empire, such as, for example, the redemption of those who've sold themselves into slavery and will thus be able to grasp what those analogies were meant to convey. For example, redemption means securing somebody's release through a payment. And Paul's basic idea in using this analogy is that the death of Christ secures the freedom of believers from slavery to, to the law or to death and become servants of God instead. Now, after this, we move on to consider six important ways of thinking about salvation, each of which is explored in dialogue with leading theologians who adopt them. And here are the six approaches we look at. Deification, that is, being made divine. Righteousness in the sight of God. Personal holiness. Authentic human existence. Political liberation. And spiritual freedom. And then we move on to look at the question of how we benefit from these. What do we need to do in order to be affected by Christ's achievement of salvation. How can we connect up with these benefits? Now, the New Testament uses the language of faith, suggesting that the faith of the individual is the channel through which these benefits are received. Others, though, see this as referring to the faith of the church, not simply that of the individual. On this reading, an individual believer benefits from Christ's death through the church as an intermediary. Now, these issues are explored and discussed in the section of the chapter entitled The Appropriation of Salvation in Christ. And this looks at four ways of thinking about this. First, the church as the means of salvation. Secondly, Christ as a representative. Thirdly, participation in Christ. And fourthly, Christ as a substitute. Now, let's look at one of these, representation. Christ is here understood as a covenant representative of humanity. So what does that mean? It means that through faith, we come to stand within the covenant between God and humanity. And Christ, by his obedience on the cross, represents God's covenant people to God, winning benefits for them as their covenantal representative. So by coming to faith, individuals come to stand within the covenant and thus participate in all its benefits, which, of course, have been won by Christ. Finally, we move on to look at the question of the scope of salvation in Christ. 
Does everyone benefit from his death? Or are there some kind of restrictions or conditions placed upon this? And there are three main options that have emerged during Christian theology's long history, and we look at all of them in this closing section. First, universalism, namely all will be saved. Secondly, only believers will be saved. And thirdly, the idea of particular redemption, only the elect will be saved. So I hope you'll enjoy working through this material and see where it leads you. There's a lot for you to think about, and I'm sure you'll enjoy working out where you would position yourself on this very broad theological map that I've given you. Our next presentation deals with the theology of the Holy Spirit, covered in chapter 12 of Christian Theology Introduction, and I look forward to speaking to you again very soon indeed. Thank you for listening.